You're listening to Life Strategies with Monique. Get ready to be empowered and inspired. Well, hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to another episode of Life Strategies with Monique. I am live here with Tamara Washington, who actually goes by the name of T.C. Washington, and T.C. is here today to share her story, and uh, my listeners out there, I do pray that you are really tuned in to this show today because Tamara is going to talk to us about the loss of her stillborn child and how she was able to overcome that tragic experience and how she was able to actually turn that into fuel for her life. Uh, Tamara, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, how are you? I'm doing very well, Monique. Thank you for having me. Um, this is the very first time that I openly speak about um, that experience. Um, it is one that's very dear to my heart. Um, I had no idea until it actually happened to me how common that still first, especially at first children, how common that was. So it was something that um, was life changing for me um, just as an individual. Um, I Everyone that has been around me for as long as they can remember knew that I desired to have a child. Um, I'm the oldest of four children. My mother's, I'm the oldest of her four and my dad's two. And that was going to be my, both of my, my parents' first grandchild. And it was a boy. So, <laughs> you know, it was something that was, you know, really, really hard, not just on me, but on my family as well. Um, I went through the pregnancy, going through the doctor's visits, going, you know, taking prenatal vitamins and going through the whole process as you would with, um, you know, just preparing, you know, for your child. And it was something that things just went terribly, terribly wrong. Um, I had been dealing with a lot of stress. I had been dealing with so many just emotional themes. Um, things weren't going well in a marriage and, um, you know, that I made the decision to obviously get married, but um, it wasn't <laughs> necessarily the best thing for my life. Right. And um, that just started, it set off a, a lot of chain events that it went from that to you know just going through having that experience and not realizing how it was going to affect the person that I was carrying that I really um was looking forward to to having you know so I, it was one of those things where you're going oh who's going to be at the baby shower or oh, who's not going to be at the baby shower and who bickering about it that one ain't going and I'm not going you know just all that stuff that we do that doesn't matter right and um when it came time for the delivery it was one that wasn't foreseen by me anyways and what I mean was I went into I had a doctor's appointment and when I went in, I'm thinking that everything was going to, you know, go according to schedule. They're going to check me and, you know, I'm going to go on with my life as usual. Well, um, he didn't move, you know, normally, you know, children, you know, because he was an active, somewhat active baby. But they were, you know, like, you know, has he moved today? And it was early in the morning. So I was like, oh, well, no. Um, not that I recall. But, you know, so, you know, they were like, well, you know, we're you know, still looking, but all I remember the nurse saying he has no heartbeat. And I was like, what do you mean he has no heartbeat? And I remember just being numb at that moment, at that moment. Cause all I could, all I could repeat to myself was my baby has no heartbeat, but I couldn't come to grips to actually verbalize my baby is dead. Those words never came out of my mouth. Um, it was challenging because it was um, just having to deal with the reality that this was not something that I was just going to go to sleep and wake up from. I sat in that hospital 
alone for quite some time. I contacted a couple of individuals that I felt comfortable with, but it was still, it was something, one of those things where yeah, I had several different things going through my head. Well, how did I not notice this? Or um, if I say this, what, how's my family going to take it? And just a whole, like I said, a whole bunch of stuff that didn't matter at that moment, trying to figure out, well, what did I do wrong? And just, like I said, I just sat there in a place of just shock. Mm -hmm. And during, was this like right when it was time for delivery or was this just a routine checkup for you to this go was, in? This was a routine checkup. I was not due for, um, my due date for him was August 19th. And I went in and uh, that day was July 16th of 2010 that that happened. And, you know, so it was, a, it was very, uh, very different. Cause I mean, it just, everything just turned around. It's like, you know, like I said, it was a routine visit and I'm thinking, okay, like I said, I was going to go on with my life as usual, but it didn't happen that way. And normally I would talk to my mom or, you know, she would be there, but I couldn't even verbalize that. And one of the things that I found to be very challenging for me um, at that time was, like I said, having to verbalize and in the questions that were asked to me. Um, some of the things that were asked to me were, you know, people trying to help me in this situation, but those things were not really helping me um, at that moment. Cause it was like, okay, well what happened? You know, everybody wants to know, but it's like, if you don't know, what happened and mm -hmm. you can't tell somebody what happened and it's like you know what i'm even though i'm carrying the child it's like i'm trying to figure this thing out just like everyone else mm -hmm. so um i had to you know experience that and one of the other things um that was even even worse i had co-workers and you know, people that I worked, um, that would come in because I used to work at a pharmacy. They would come in and bring me gifts for the baby. I mean, the baby, it was, you know, a lot of people were really looking forward and they were, they were happy to see that I was happy. And, um, you know, just being, you know, in the hospital, it was challenging because the, the nurse practitioner who was assisting me at the time, she really didn't express that um, sense of care. It was like, oh, your baby's dead and, you know, you just go on with life. That was the attitude. And there was no comforting. And I just sat there. And um, like I said, I, had, I didn't have the nerve. I'm a very vocal person, especially when I'm passionate about something. And I just didn't have the nerve to even really speak. And there were people that were very close to me that, were like, well, why didn't she tell me? It was hard for me to tell myself <laughs> mm -hmm. what was really going on. Wow. To really, like I said, come to grips, you know, and, you know, being a, a believer, the first thing is like, well, why didn't you respond in faith? Why didn't you speak the word? Why didn't you do this with all the power that, you know, you had? and it was just all these things. And it, I felt like it's so easy for you to tell me about what I should and should not have done when you were not the one having the experience. So no, you don't know what you would or would not have do because it did not happen to you. Right. Right. Because if I were in the situation, not living it, I probably would have thought that I would have responded differently as well until I was really put in that situation. Because this baby wasn't just, um, he wasn't just a child that I was carrying. At that point, like I said, I was going through a lot of things in my marriage. I was going through um, just, just a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this life was just happening to me. <laughs> and um, it was, like I said, one of those things that just, it was, 
I don't even really know the words to just describe that type of agony. And then the insult to the agony from the outside. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I I got into a place um, of really just, like I said, of numbness. Mm -hmm. You know, I really just went into another place within myself. I did not want to really speak about what I had to say because some of the emotions that I was experiencing at the time, you don't want to sound crazy with, with all those emotions and people have a way you may say one thing and they can interpret it however they want to interpret it. And, um, they, you know, it can, it can cause a lot of, a lot of pain either way. So I didn't feel comfortable really expressing the thoughts that, you know, the, the guilt, the, the shame, the, um, just all that, you know, all of that. And I really, you know, and then it was more challenging also because, um, I wasn't just going through it alone in the capacity of, um, with my ex-husband, he, you know, it was, you know, he's looking forward to his, his son being born and here it is, his brothers have sons and, you know, then his baby dies and, you know, and it's something that he still has not fully come to that place of moving forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, But for me, I got to really get to know the baby for as much. I mean, he was on the inside of me. And there was one particular moment where I remember it was late, maybe in the wee hours in the morning. And um, I remember worshiping because that's something that I'm always, you know, singing and walking around and doing this since I was a child. And um, when I stopped at one point, the baby kicked me. And I was like, what? I was like, this baby, I stopped singing and this, you mean to tell me this baby? And he kicked me hard too. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one thing that stayed with wow. me. Wow. And that was the thing that, um, caused me to really look at if I stopped worshiping and this child kicked me, if I stopped worshiping, meaning in this capacity, if I stopped living, then it would make everything that we experienced in his life have been vanity. But if he wasn't in my life for any other purpose than that, it was to push me because I had, before all those things happened, I was in a very, very dark place in in my mind um because of some things that i had went to i had went through prior to that i was really really um really depressed Mm -hmm. i didn't know if i wanted to go backwards i didn't know if i wanted to go forward i just didn't know what i wanted to do and i was very bitter right (laughs) um very bitter because of the things that happened you know like i said prior to that Mm -hmm. and um it just really put me in, in just a state where to really begin to examine really my actions and what I was going to do. I remember laying on the bed, I'm on laying on the floor, excuse me, laying on the floor for at least maybe about two or three days, um, you know, after it happened, because I had one person call me and ask me, so when you going to set the funeral arrangements? And I'm thinking to myself, you actually going to call me. I haven't even dealt with the fact that this is even happening. And you calling me like, I just push out a dead baby and, and I bones back like a pop tart. I had a problem with that. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm, I, I made it known <laughs> uh, <laughs> that I had a problem with that. But it's these type of things that I think that sometimes when you're not in a situation, people, they want to help, but they don't really realize how, how these things can be somewhat offensive um, to someone that's suffering from that type of loss. Because like I said, I didn't just lose my, my son. I lost a friend because at that time I felt like I couldn't trust anybody. Mm. And he was the only person that I did trust. If I felt anything, if I, whatever I felt, the baby knew, you know, I would talk to him 
um, about what I was feeling. And um, it was just one of those things where my dad, when he came in as I laid on the floor, I remember him saying, you know what? It could have been you and that baby. Then what? And I remember those words and it was like, you know, the then what? <laughs> you know, if that had happened, I wouldn't have a second chance or a third chance to change any of the, the things that that happened. Um, you know, I wouldn't have a, a do over. But the mere fact that God did not allow that to happen to me meant that I should push forward because if I did not push forward, then it was basically to me a slap in the face or being ungrateful that I was given. My baby couldn't be brought back, but it's like, are you going to allow your worship to stop? Are you going to allow your living to stop? And it's like, how many other people have gone through this type of thing and they're still stuck in that place? I made up in my mind that I deserve to live and I wanted to live because God gave me the opportunity to. And just like the baby kicked me when I stopped worshiping that day, it's the same thing that I needed to do. I needed that kick in the rear end to continue to move forward. That was my reality check. Wow. That it could have been me, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. Wow. And um, I remember going back to work and doing much better you know, I went back maybe, I think it was like three months, um, three months or so. It happened in July and I returned back to work um, in September. And I was in the in the process of uh, being trained to become a pharmacy technician at the time. And I just went there with my, I had it on my mind. <laughs> I had it on my mind that I was going to do better. And I did that because I made up in my mind, the pharmacy manager, he was just in awe because he was like, you, you realize basically you're beating your numbers, mm -hmm. you know, and it, you know, after having it, it was like, it, it put me in that place where I felt like I had been challenged. I felt like I had been challenged on a, on a whole different level, um, just as an individual, because it was like, um, how can I, how can I put it? My back was then against the wall. It was almost like I had been called out that was I going to rise above the experience mm -hmm. or was I going to allow my fears, my insecurities, my feelings to control my existence or was I going to push to actually change the situation so I can be in a position to help somebody else. And mm -hmm. I chose to push through. And women from different, I had several different women that came to the pharmacy while I was working and shared their experience with me. One lady even told me that she had like seven stillborns before she had one child. And I told her, I said, ma'am, I said, I'm sorry. I don't know if I, I said one was enough for me. And, um, you know, but um, one other lady, she mentioned to me that she still struggles with that because of the fact that this was a child that you were anticipating and you, you could always look at, I have three, but I should have had four, you know, that type of thing. And what this child would have been like when I went through it, I was um, at 35 weeks of my pregnancy. So he was full term. Well, he was, um, he wasn't full term according to the standards, but he was, you know, pretty much he could have been born at that time and still right. been all right. Mm -hmm. And um, I did birth the baby. <laughs> and then I have my daughter now who was birthed at 35 weeks. Wow. And, um, you know, so it's, it's just one of those things that you have to have the determination in your mind, regardless to how you end up in those type of situations. No, you cannot control um, whether you're going to have a stillbirth or not. I mean, if you're doing everything that you can to make sure that you're, um, you're eating properly, you're taking care of yourself, you're following doctor's orders, you're, you're not doing all the things that you wouldn't, there's certain things that are, are beyond you, mm -hmm. you know, there's certain things, because I've had several, I've had other ladies, you know, like, I'm not, you know, I was fine, and why this happened to me? Mm -hmm. so, I don't have the answers as to why it happened. I know what I was experiencing at the time that that happened to me.
However, if someone was to find themselves in that place, the question that I would say that would be asked that wouldn't probably add to the guilt, you know, or that what why um, would be the thing, the fact that you are still alive and the focus on the positive versus focusing on something that is done. Right. But if you've done everything that you knew to do as a loving, caring mother, what else was there for you to do? I had, you know, different individuals tell me, well, maybe you need to have an autopsy. And I was like, no, I'm not going to cut up my baby because the answer could very well not be in him. The answer could be in me. So now you Mm. just cut up my baby for what? You know, and um, I just spoke out of my mouth. I said, if and when I do have other children, they're going to be perfectly healthy and I'm not going to go through this again. And I didn't. Mm-hmm. I have two beautiful, healthy, bouncing baby girls. Awesome. <laughs> <You know, they're, laughs> yeah, they're six and three now. And, you know, it's just the idea that I got double for my trouble, you mm-hmm. know. And just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just me as an individual, I can look at where I was in terms of, you know, maturity um, and just, you know, just the place where I was. I was in a much better place. Because I chose to position myself to, um, and the blessed part about it, I conceived my oldest daughter the same exact day, one year later from when my son, um, when I went through the delivery process with my son, July 16th, 2010, I was giving birth to him. July 16th, 2011, I conceived her. And I had no idea, you know, because I wasn't even thinking about it. I really... God had brought me to a place where by this time that I had such a peace within myself that I wasn't even focused on the fact that of when, when it was, I didn't really, you know, think about what the date was. I remember my mom calling me like, well, you know what today is? And I was like, no. And I was like, oh, you know, she had to remind me, Mm -hmm. but that's how quick that the situation turned around and you know, my ex-husband and I, we had been trying and we just, you know, I had gotten really, I can't really say how he felt for sure at that moment, but mm-hmm. it was one of those things where it was like, okay, Lord, or am I being punished, mm-hmm. you know, for what happened, you know, and why I can't get pregnant again. And right when I got to the point to say, you know what, I'm not even going to worry about this anymore. That's when I found out I was pregnant. And unfortunately, that's also when I started grieving <laughs> uh, because uh, wow. I I didn't I didn't really I really didn't grieve with everyone else because it was kind of hard. I had my ex husband walking around. I mean, he had gone through so much changes uh, just within himself. I walked up on him, you know, at Walmart while he was getting something because we hadn't seen each other for some time and I, I didn't even recognize who he was because he had put on just that much weight because of the stress that, that happened. So it affected him too. Um, and it just, like I said, all of us, my dad took it very hard. Like I said, this is the first grandchild. And when my baby girl was born, my dad was like, she looks so much like my grandson. Oh, wow. And, um, and she did. <laughs> to the point where I looked at it and I was like, ooh, is this the same baby again? I was like, I don't even want to let my mind, you know, go into all those places. But she looked right. she, she looked that much like him. Um, but it was it was one of those things, like I said, I had that determination in my mind and, and those that have been around me and we talked about the control issue. I'm mm-hmm. I'm the one that, <laughs> that is going to um you know, just that, that stubborn, uh, stubborn will that I have that, that works for me sometimes and it has worked against me. <laughs> many right. times. But that, that stubborn will that just that mind to just not take no for an answer mm-hmm. and to just say, you know what, I'm not the first and I'm not going to be the last. Mm-hmm. And out of, out of everything that I could do, it's like, you know, or could have been, now I have another opportunity to really begin to live. Um, because all before that happened to me, I was just living my life in a, <sighs> um, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places. That type of scene was going on. And, 
you know, just with some things that, you know, you really, and I don't want to talk too much about it because of what's written in the book and what's coming. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, it's, um, it's coming. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> right. Right. Cause I don't want to go all into it. It's like, no, yeah. read the book, read the book, yeah. read the book. Uh, but, um, you know, it really was, like I said, it hurt. Yeah. It really was that thing. Like I said, that really was just that, that breaking. Cause like I told you, I have been in that, I was in a dark place and I didn't even know who I was anymore. You know, I had really just lost all sense of touch with my true identity, you know, like what my, what I liked, what I didn't like. It was like, everything was just focused on just so many other factors that, like I said, really at this point, I, I find to be very laughable the fact that I even was thinking like that, but um, I was <laughs> as a sleeping beauty woke up. <laughs> yeah. And um, it, like I said, it a person has to have a mind. I had praying people. I have praying people in my life. So I, I never want to discount that. You know, I'm one of the ones that was blessed to have people that prayed for me. That was one of the other things that was really, really pivotal in that situation. They weren't, you know, even though there were some some critics, you know, but I, I had the power of prayer behind me to push me out of that and the will to move because people could pray all they want. But if you don't have a mind to come in line and say, you know what, I will to do this, those prayers are going to be laid in store for the day <laughs> that, you, <laughs> that you decide to you, to take action. But thank God that he gave me a mind to want to move forward. And those prayers were prayed, which helped to strengthen me along my journey. And um, one of the things that also that I'm working that are in works that's in works right now is my nonprofit organization that for these type of situations, because everybody, whether we like it or not, however we feel, everybody is not in church. And I want to make that very clear that if, if you're in the position where you have people that are godly people that are supportive of you and, you know, want to see you do what it is that God has called you to do, then you're beyond blessed. Mm -hmm. But for those that are not that fortunate, there still has to be a place where they can go, where they can feel comfortable that with expressing themselves without the fear of, oh, if I say this, what are they going to think? Are they going to look at me different? Because a lot of that comes, if most people that go through some of the things that I've experienced, I can say that a lot of it was through different things insecurities that happen through things that they may not even be consciously aware of that they've been affected by. So they're coming in, they're sensitive, they're fragile about certain things. And you never want to, you know, you don't want to, if you basically, if you don't know the right thing to say, or God does not give you utterance on what to say, the best thing is to say, you know what, if you need me, I'll be there. Mm -hmm. But that person has to have that, they have to feel like they want to talk to you. You know, it's not saying well, I was there for her. If you were not the person <laughs> that that individual felt like they were comfortable speaking to at, at that moment, then pray that God would put somebody that they do feel comfortable with sharing those, it did, those intricate details of their lives. One, I'm a writer. And just something that, you know, I started doing even before I got to this point to start doing the books. I've always just jotted down my feelings. I could be sitting down, you know, at school or just wherever I am and I'll write something, you know, and I'll come back because I've always done that. That's one thing that I support and I encourage because sometimes you need a way to get it out. And sometimes you just, you can't tell folks your business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you just can't tell folks your business. Um, cause before, you know, it won't be just your business. It'll be everybody's business. Mm -hmm. So the best thing, you know, is just find you a diary, find you somewhere that's your safe place for your thoughts, for your, um, uh, for your use. So you can look at it to track your progress. So you can begin to actually start looking at why do I feel this way? Where did all this stem from? What is the positive way to look at it? This may be 
an indifferent way. This may be a negative way, but focus on what is the positive view? What can I change about this situation, if anything? What foundation can I begin to lay in my own life that I can stand on? What positive words? That's another thing that helped me to come out of this. Positive words. Um, I began to look at different affirmations. You know, I love Zig Ziglar. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, he, he's one of my favorites. And you have to, like I said, gravitate towards the positive. I mean, that's one of the things that if nothing else is remembered from this, I had several different thoughts. Like I said, I was very depressed, um, dealt with suicidal thoughts, um, all these different things that, that were going on, not just in that, from just throughout my life, just with dealing with depression. So I've been there, you know, and I just, for anybody who is going to be listening or, um, you know, to this, you know, to understand that a lot of people do not want to talk about these things because they want everybody to see my life is this and my life is that. But you're hurting yourself in the process of trying to please people that may not even care. Mm. And if anyone is thinking at a point to see your downfall, that means that they're already in a bad place. So that's not someone that you want to be trying to please because if they're already down, then and they're going to try to pull you down with them. So it's the, no matter what it appears to be, search to really start examining what the true motive of that individual or those individuals are and really just start to really just build, like I said, a basis to have a positive relationship with you <laughs> and not with everyone else but that comes to having to take that time out and that's one of the things that happened um for me as a result of what happened with my son it didn't happen over it was a course of time but that was where it began that was where i began to take steps that was the thing that you know it's kind of like the road runner the road runner just goes and goes and goes <laughs> you know until you know something happens and it's like oh wait a minute you know I'm, the coyote decides to fall off the cliff or however the thing goes, you know, it stops to pay attention to something else. That was the thing that caught my attention to make me to stop looking at all this other stuff to pause and really begin to look and to take direction. It's okay. I can run, <laughs> but I need to have a solid, you know, I need to have an aim. I need to be intentional about where that aim is, that energy is going to be directed to. Um, and with the book, I couldn't say everything that I desired to say in the <laughs> anthology. Um, however, however, um, I am in the process of writing my book and um, I am going to dedicate, you know, a couple of chapters or, you know, just all depends on how the Lord gives me to lay it out. You know, speaking about this experience with stillbirths, like I said, I think that it's very important because like I said, when I found out, how common it was, I was in awe. Mm. I really, really was in awe. But it is one of the most humbling experiences. I had never, that really was the worst thing that I had ever been through. Right. I, I, that was that was it. I never, I had been mean, prior to that. If someone would have told me that I would have went through that, I'd have been like, I'm not coming out of that. I, I just don't see how I could how I could move forward. Right, right, right. But through God, I did move forward, right. you know, mm -hmm. because having a mind to overcome, but it was not easy. It was not easy. So I don't want anyone to think that it's just like, you're going to pop a pill and you're going to get through it. No, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You have to, there are going to be times where thoughts are going to come, but it's putting the positive in place of the negative. You have the negative thought, inject something positive until it becomes a, a norm and it, you develop that habit of doing that to mm -hmm. the point where you're not even thinking about doing it consciously. It's just what you do. You have, you're in one position and you're facing opposition, then you reposition and you do it consistently and you keep going. And before you know it, you'll find yourself on the other side. Wow. That is just absolutely amazing and such a powerful story. And one of the things that you said that stood out the most to me was how 
God sent a sign to you, how you would be singing to your baby and the baby kicked you. But that was the the thing that really, God was really saying to you, don't stop, continue your worship. You're going to get through this. And you did just that. And not only that, you're now helping other Mm -hmm. women who are going through the exact same thing. So it just, it just reminds me of the power of God and how God still speaks to us today. And we just need to be conscious of how he speaks to us. Um, and then you also said, um, so oftentimes we want to hold ourselves accountable and we do a lot of times we want to do that. So, um, tell our listeners, how is it that, um, you're able to really, really, really focus on that positive because when you see so much negative and then in your circumstances, how can uh, a woman who was going through what you've been through, how could she, how does she really, what does she really, really need to do? And you've given a lot of great strategies today, but on that positive thing, and I know you said write affirmations, but what is the one thing that you would consider to be the most important thing that she would need to do? to to overcome what i would have to say would be the most important thing to remain consistent it would be definitely to remain consistent with wanting to continue the process Mm -hmm. despite and recommitting to the commitment every day Mm -hmm. that to say, well, I know that I feel like I want to give up, but I started out on this journey and I'm going to continue because I have to. See, when you stop, when you don't make things an option, it's either I go or I go. When you, as, you can't leave that door open. You have to burn the bridge. Mm-hmm. As long as you give yourself the option to say, well, you know what? I could just stay in this place. No, that is not an option. Right. You know, so that would have to be the thing to, to commit to the commitment, despite to look at the goal, to remember why the journey was started to begin with. What was the purpose? And sometimes in order to stay in that place, sometimes you may have to separate anybody that's going to be anti the mission. Mm. They have to, you have to remove yourself, anything that, anything that is against anything that's going to stop you until, like I said, you out of that infancy, what I would consider to be the infancy period with that moment where you're fragile, you're vulnerable. Um, but you have to begin to be pro self. You have to get excited about you. And that's one of the things that I did. I had to stop believing the lies that were told to me. If that, if that makes any sense, there was a lot mm-hmm. of things that was before all, before that happened, it, I had to, I had a lot of negative stuff that was in my psyche from my childhood and growing up. Like I said, it was a building thing. I just didn't arrive at the place where I got it. And those things did attempt to resurface. But like I said, I had those affirmations. I had the word of the Lord to begin to inject that into those places. So that's why I say the word needs to be in place. It's just like going to the doctor and you have been diagnosed. But if you, the, the sickness or the illness that you have, you have to stay out of certain environments where you know that this thing is going to be in order to be, to remain free from it. And if you do not, you're going to be right back at the hospital having to take the medicine again. So we want to make sure that we don't have to take medicine, that we can take vitamins, which would be the word, which would be the positive to make sure that the immune system is built, meaning the mind is built in a place where you can remain strong. So in some, with some different illnesses, if your immunity is built up, you can go around it and it's not going to affect you. But if you're not at that point, it's going to, you're going to keep going having these relapses. So it is, the process has to remain consistent. Stay out of the environment, for one, mm-hmm. in the, especially in the infancy. Stay out of the environment. 
if certain things are going to trigger certain responses, certain music, um, certain food, certain smells. Um, I remember I had the smell of my son's blood in my nostrils for mm. quite a while. And certain things would trigger it like out of, out of nowhere. So there were certain places that I couldn't go. But mm -hmm. it's finding out what those triggers are. And making sure that what are your safeguards. Playing music that's going to bring you into a happy place. Not I miss you. Like stuff like with Aaron Hall. That was an old song. You don't want to play stuff like that. <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're in a place like that, that's not conducive to the mission. That's anti-mission. Right. <laughs> you know, we want to put some, you know, we want to put something on um, that's going to bring you into a happy place. I remember, now that you asked me, I remember even changing the colors in my room. I put, I had pinks, I had yellows. Everything that was going to bring forth light, um, everything that was going to bring forth light, I began to research how pink affected the mind, how, you know, just everything in my environment. I tried to stay as much out of dark places. Like I said, my whole environment had to change to create an atmosphere in my mind that was going to reflect where I wanted to go. I remember I even did a photo shoot. I got all dressed up. Um, I still don't have those pictures, but I, it was just good for me to do <laughs> because I got so excited over the proofs that I don't remember what I had so much going on back then, but it was good for me to really look at because that was my point of transition also from going from a little girl into becoming uh, a woman into learning how to be a lady. Mm -hmm. um, I, that was, that was that place for me. That was where my rite of passage began to, you know, kind of like that thing to say, look, I'm, that thing right there that you're doing, it ain't going to work. You know, that was, that was that, you know, that was that place of, you know, learning really how to love me. Like I said, I had to, I love everybody else, but I had to begin to be pro me. Right. And, um, you know, it was like to really, one of the things that I would tell myself, no one has the right to tell me that I don't have the right to be who I am. Mm. You mm. may not like it, but you don't have the right, <laughs> you know, to, to dictate where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do. The only person who has the authority is God. And I had to begin to tell myself those things. I had to take back. That was the other thing I made. Like I told you about the control thing in my behavior. I had to make in my mind to control the fact that I was going to remain in control that I was not going to allow other people to control me by how they treated me, what they said, what they did. Um, and I, like I said, those things had to become constant. I had to make up, I made up in my mind that I was going to stand for me, even if no one else did, mm -hmm. you know, that was, that was the thing. Like I said, I told myself things like that. I when situations, I took it one step at a time. First time I deal with confrontation, I'm going to stand up. Okay, I got through that. It happens again because that's, that's life. You know, you're going to have experiences. You're going to face challenges, but it's how you respond that's going to make the world a difference. And I, I just committed myself to the process of turning things around. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, if I put myself in these positions, I can also take myself out of these positions. Mm -hmm. um, a very wise lady in my life, told me many, many years ago, and she said, remember, you always have the power of choice. Mm -hmm. And that, that was one of the keys, remaining and remembering, I have the power of choice. Children oftentimes get violated because they can't choose certain things, but as an adult, you have the power of choice. And it's standing firm on that and not being moved. And like I said, I've always been stubborn. If my daddy was listening to this right now, he'd be like, Ooh, <laughs> yes, Lord. <laughs> but, uh, but that stubborn portion, I was stubborn against many things that I shouldn't have been stubborn in my immaturity and in my adolescence and you know, what I thought was me being grown at a point. But as God began to... Um, help me to mature that same thing, that same stubborn will. I just 
turned it. I, like I said, I'm not going to tell you I'm not stubborn. I'm still stubborn. I'm just not stubborn against things that I know could cause me. Um, I'm stubborn against things that I know could cause me harm, mm-hmm. not the things that could be potentially good in my life. And and I, I'm a person that I check myself most of the time before someone even has a chance to come to me. Me and self had, we, we've had these conversations, you know, and how I'm going to do it. So when someone else comes to me, it's not something that I don't know. And I think that's, that's the other thing. You have to walk in your truth. In order for change to come, you have to acknowledge what went wrong and how it went wrong versus just being evasive um, and not acknowledging what happened. What did you do? And you do want to hold yourself accountable you know, for that, but not hold yourself so accountable to the point where it's like you've condemned yourself to a judgment that God didn't even give because mm-hmm. of guilt. And I think that that, that was also something that I had. It's, I beat, basically, if I was punished by the Lord for my actions, I think that I was, I imposed a, a harsher sentence on myself for many years than even what God imposed upon me because it took me a long time to forgive myself Mm -hmm. um for even being in the position where i was for such a thing to even happen Mm -hmm. you know so that was something that i also it took me a long time Mm -hmm. and this and that's that's a powerful thing that you just said about number one walking in your truth and then having the ability to have the power of choice that is so major but the the last thing that you just said which is so important and i want my listeners out there to get this is that forgiveness is key because when we don't forgive ourselves we hold ourselves hostage right. and we can be free from all of that if we would just forgive you know forgiving ourselves um forgiving others and then even forgiving god because sometimes we can be mad at god you know for things that have occurred in our lives and you made the decision to to forgive yourself but then you also chose to use it as your fuel, which is what led you to your ministry. So talk a little bit more about your ministry. Um, in terms of my personal ministry, which I, you know, kind of put as an overall whole, just being a servant of the Lord, just on behalf of the kingdom, wherever I am. Um, that is one of the things that, that I focus on, making sure that, turning everything into fuel it doesn't matter what it is even me as a a single mom now that is that is something that I had to I got married you know I didn't see myself being a single mom and so that was another thing that I had to turn around my view on that and to work through that to begin to focus more on time management to begin to um you know look at every situation as an opportunity versus um, you know, something that, oh, this is a challenge. It's an opportunity. I've been, you know, because a lot of times until you come to those places, you don't really tap into those places, those areas of your mind of where you really get to see what creativity is in there. And so that overall, I would have to say when it comes down to my ministry, just what I do, that's one of the things that God uses me to do. I can see things that others may never see. The way that he has um, blessed me mentally, my creativity after going through this stuff has opened up on a whole different plane. Quite honestly, the things, the thoughts that I think in this, the way that I see the world, I never saw all of that before having these experiences. A whole new world opened up to me that, you know, that's what I, you know, encourage people to do. That is something that I feel very strongly about. You can create the reality that you see. You can create it if you believe that it is. Mm, That's powerful. You know, you can create it. So my, I always tell people, it's like everyone else may see the world in black and white and these blues. I said, but I see the world in purple. You know, so people are like, girl, why you see the, I see the world in a, in an aspect. I see situations, things that I would do. Other people, girl, I would never do that. It's like, well, I'm so glad that God chose me to be me. And I'm, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm so glad that he did because I, I, some of the things that I've come across is like, oh Lord, I think y'all don't think like that, you know, but that's, um, you know, that's where the joy comes in. 
mm-hmm. being able to embrace my experience. You know, I hear that people say, you know, oh, staying in my lane. I like my lane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like my lane. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I really do enjoy driving in my own lane. Uh-huh. Um, you know, and when I'm encountering people on a day to day and, you know, just sharing words of encouragement, that's something. Be happy about you. Don't ever allow anybody to make you feel like you don't deserve the breath that God put on the inside of you. He gave it to you. He designed you the way that he wanted you to be. That's be- the, because that's, he wanted that for you. And so it shouldn't be something where you cave in around other people because you don't have the courage to stand up in who God designed you to be. And I think that's one of the things that is so cruel that some people do to other people to try to intimidate them because they don't have the courage to stand up and walk in their truth. Mm. So they, they create, they tr- create this uh, false sense of, uh, they try to create this false sense of fear to control the other person. And if that person doesn't recognize it for what it is, then they stay in the bondage of, and they ask them, well, is something wrong with me? Because, no, there's nothing wrong with you. There's a bunch of us walking around here that have faced the same types of challenges. And it's time to rise up. So, Tamara, tell us about uh, your anthology. Um, the anthology, I'm very, very excited. Very, very excited. I'm, I'm being very transparent. Um, in the anthology, I mean, like I said, I mean, I'm sharing with you all things that some of it I, you know, may talk about, you know, from time to time in passing or when it's necessary. Um, but I, this is the first time that I really come forth, um, with this. And I want everyone who is listening to understand that when anthologies or, you know, any production about the life of a person, um, is brought forth. Um, It is not to um, uh, discredit anyone's character. Let me, let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Because some, because then you have to also, you know, take into consideration that that's that person's life experience. Right. And what's the name of the book? The name of the book is I Rise, Living Beyond the Bruises. Wow. That's powerful. (laughs) So we, so we have to uh, talk about (laughs) the bruises, how they, how they got there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So you have to, so you have to know, uh, you know, some history, you know, and one of the things that I also want to bring light to with the anthology, the purpose of it is not to focus on the cause of the bruises, but to show through all that transpired in the past, how each of the ladies that shared a portion of their story was able to transition from one place to the other. And that's the thing that I would, you know, want someone to understand that it's not about what happened because we all have experiences. That is life. Life itself is an experience. But it's when you are able to take a situation that you and those who witnessed knew could have destroyed you and turn it into something that has helped to build you instead, and you're able to take what the foundation that was built as a result of the experience and to be able to tell others about how they're able to do the same. Many people don't do things, not because they don't want to in all aspects. Some people don't know that they even have those type of options. Um, I, for one, learned a lot of things uh, on my journey. Like I said, my creativity opened up on a different level, um, especially in many cases. I had so much pressure on me um, that I had to figure it out. And I had to start really thinking critically on, on levels that I didn't because it was the fight of my life, <laughs> basically, you know, to, for me to say, you know, you're going to sink or swim. You're going to, uh, you know, make what decision you're going to go left or right. What really are you going to do? And no matter what anyone else may have thought, the decision was mine mm-hmm. on how I was going to move forward. And that's when, that's the focal point and why I decided to, um, 
step in to um, the anthology upon before um, Precious and I began to speak. I was actually because I had thought about it for years to write a book and things happened and it just wasn't priority. It was, just wasn't priority. It didn't become priority until I really started looking at some of the things that was going on around me, looking at not really focusing on the why, because in many cases I already knew the why, but to come in with solutions, to come in and say, hey, there's another way. You don't have to become a product of your environment. You don't have to um, throw in the whole game because you might have played the first half might have been off. You have four quarters in a football game. You have four quarters, um, I believe, in a basketball game also. I'm not a big sports person, so y'all forgive me if I mess something up. No, just keeping it real, just being very honest. Um, you have another opportunity. And one thing that I personally coin and tell people, it doesn't matter if you have made seven horrible decisions. You can make one key decision and to turn that whole situation around if you are willing to do the work. It may take you years. Some situations you just don't clear up just over overnight. Oh, I repent and it's, and it's gone. No, there's consequences, you know, and I had to deal with. So I don't want anyone. Um, I tried to give as much information for those who are planning on, um, you know, supporting us with what we're doing with the anthology. I want you all listeners to know that I try to provide as much information as possible, but please, please follow us. Please come to the book signing. Please come because there are things, speaking engagements that we're going to have where we're going to be able to speak to you all more. We're going to be able to answer questions. We're going to be able to bring more clarity that we're not able to give just in, in the session of the, the book is, um, I'm going to say the gateway, but don't stop stop at the gateway, walk through the door, you know, and, and really see what it is because most of us who are a part of the anthology, we are not just writers. I mean, we're moms, we are um, entrepreneurs. We have uh, are as um, Precious always says, um, the host of the, who may help to make the anthology possible, momtrepreneurs. I like that, that phrase that she called because you know, just that hat, just being a mom. And if you're a single mom like myself, um, that is something that also gives you that added drive because you have to make it happen. It's not just contingent upon you. You have children or you have a child who is dependent on you to make a difference. And when you position yourself in a better position, then you also create a, a better situation for that child as well. And then it just goes on and then those around are able to reap the benefit. So it's an honor for me to be a part of this anthology, to be able to share. Cause a lot of times people see where what the conclusion of the matter is, but they really don't know the story behind. You don't know the tears. You don't know the pain and the agony and the suffering that a person had to endure to be able to speak and be like, oh, she just spoke so well, but you don't know. <laughs> you don't know where all that, all that came from to be able to have the confidence to be able to say, you know what, like it or not, world, this is my story and I'm sharing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? That's so powerful. And, and I love um, the movement that is about to take place with this amazing book that's coming out, Living Beyond, I Rise, Living Beyond the Bruises, because there's so many powerful stories. Um, and that's what I love about just, you know, this show and you being able to be on it, to just be able to share the story because your stories are so powerful and they're so life changing that I, I know that even just listening to your story today, that there are so many women out there that are just being changed just by hearing the hope and hope in your voice and knowing that there is life after, you know, after the struggle that they may be uh, in a difficult place right now, but guess what? They can get above that. They can rise above that. So in that, it's just, it's just so powerful um, that you ladies are actually putting your stories in one place um, to encourage basically the world. And it's not only ending there, as you said, um, it's going to open up even more doors for you guys to be able to share stories. So 
um, on that note, if someone um, who's encouraged by your story today wanted to get in touch with you, who um, wanted to get more information, how could they get in touch with you? Um, well, I do have uh, my Facebook page um, right now that is being worked on. Um, it will be under Tamara Cares. That is T A M A R A Cares. Um, and they can go, I'll be posting different things and also different tools, um, words of encouragement um, and support. And if someone wants they, you know, to reach out to me personally, they can go to my personal Facebook page. Um, I do welcome that. They can be, you know, free to um, send me a request. It's under Tamara um, Washington and TC in parentheses. Um, like I said, that's what I prefer to be addressed as TC. And, um, you know, that I, I welcome that because I, I was blessed and I was fortunate to be able to have people in my life that were there for me to support and encourage me. But I am aware that there are circumstances and there are people out there that do not have much of what I had. And someone, you know, they may not feel comfortable in wanting to speak with their peers or even family members because sometimes I feel like you know, people can just be so harsh, so harsh. And I know what I've experienced and I try to make it a point. And I'm not going to even say I try. I do make it a point that to put myself in the other person's shoes when someone um, talks to me about things that those um, sensitive areas um, in their lives, I want everyone to know that I am who I am and what I am, not because I was just so intelligent that I just had this magic uh, formula. God gave me the mind and the insight to be able to see what needed to be done and to be, and to have the, um, like I said, the will and he placed, he, he put things there for me to be able to access because he already knew the bad decisions that I was going to make. He already knew all those things that I was going to do, you know, but he was the one who was there. He made all this possible. There was nothing that I could tell you that um, I necessarily did. Like I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm very intelligent, but I'm not that intelligent, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> not in comparison, <laughs> not in comparison is to say all this, everything that I've done, Everything that I am doing, um, everything that I'm creating at this point, the books that are being written, um, the nonprofit organization, my businesses, none of these things would be possible if it wasn't for God. Because there were many days where I received no's. There were many days where people might have not felt like they wanted to be bothered. There wasn't much that I had to go through, but there were doors that were shut and there were many doors that were open and so you know i understand and i know what it is to to have to go through that but i want every listener to understand even if you say well i don't read my bible i haven't been to church in a long time right where you are you have the opportunity to reach out to the lord just to be sincere um to repent whatever your truth is i mean if you can't be honest with anyone else you should be able to be honest with yourself in order to be in a position to be honest with God about the areas where you need help with because he already knows anyway and that was one of the things that also helped me I was able to be honest with him to say look Lord you know these are my issues this this thing right here Lord if you don't help me I'm not gonna be helped <laughs> you know and I had and I got to that point where I had to and every day I still you know dealing with different things in my life and I have to talk to him about those things consistently. But if you really want help, you can't go to a doctor and um, the doctor says, well, hi, ma'am, you know, what's bringing you in here today? And you'd be like, well, doc, I really don't want to tell you, you know, how is he supposed to help you? <laughs> you know, he can't help you if you don't tell him what it is that's causing the pain. Even though he may have an idea, you still have to confirm that. So he's able to give you the proper direction to be able to go forward. And that's what this process is about. It is not about what you did as so much. What are you going to do? Right. That's what it's about. Absolutely. You know, so I'm definitely open, very open um, 
to having people contact me via my Facebook, um, via my page. Like I said, I'm going to be posting things in Tamara Cares because it's not about, like I said, it doesn't matter what you did, how many years you did it. That's not, that's not what we're here for. We're not here to remind you. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, we're here to show some love and support and to be there to help while you're going through the process of, of arriving at the, the conclusion for your life that God has and to, you know, be able to build businesses and to be able to um, just be the strong person in mind, body and soul, you know, and, you know, to be able to live that, that is so important. You know, it's a lot of things that come to discourage you. And a lot of things ultimately just come and it's like they have before you even get to the door. It's like you already know that there's going to be a no on the door. But the but it comes down to saying, you know what, even if there is a no at the door, I'm strong enough to be able to turn that into a yes, if that's the door that I'm truthfully supposed to walk into. And I come, I have a I have sales experience. So I kind of took something from that, that you always have to, when you're selling a product or anything, you're really selling yourself because some products you can get them from anywhere, Mm -hmm. but what makes the person want to come and patronize your business? What, and it's, it's the service that you provide. So you have to believe enough in yourself to provide, uh, to service your needs. You have to, you know, say, well, you know what I deserve to, you know, be able to, you know, take care of me because God gave me the breath. I deserve, you know, what makes me different from anyone else that I can't do this. You know, that's, that's the thing. It's, you know, having that, that drive and that determination and knowing that you're worth it, knowing that you, you have to first make, even if you, if you don't know, you have to make yourself believe that you are worth it. You have to sell yourself. You have to say the benefits, focus on the good things about you, whatever it is that you do well, whatever gifts, if you're a writer, I'm a good writer. I'm a good mother. I am a good, because there's so many things on the world that you're not this and you're not that. No, but I may not be all this, that, and this, but I am this. And just that alone means I'm worth it, Mm. you know? And that's, that's the thing, you know, so that's one of the things that I focus, you know, when I'm speaking with ladies or just when I'm speaking with anyone, because people may not um, acknowledge it as much. People associate low self-esteem with women only, but there are a lot of men walking around with low self-esteem as well. Mm. So, you know, we want the men to not just think that even though we're ladies who have written this, that they can't come to the book signing, that they can't come to these events and feel just as welcome in the midst of us because they may have experienced some of the things that we have experienced. These are life tools that we are providing for everyone. And even if it's not for them personally, they may feel like, well, I'm in a good place. I don't need it. No, come and hear something. Come become a resource, be able to help someone else to be able to check it out. They may be able to benefit. Mm -hmm. So just come follow us. Um, All of the ladies, um, have different experiences, different things um, that have have transpired. So I am in full support, not just of just of the things that I'm doing. I mean, I, like I told you, I am pro me, but I'm not anti everyone else. I am pro, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, so we are doing this as a, as right. a collective whole. You know, right. but come and take advantage. That's what I want the listeners to do. Come and follow us. Come. And see what it is that we're doing. Like I said, the, the book, um, we are happy and excited about the book, but that is the gateway. That is awesome. the door. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tamara. And to my listeners out there, please be on the lookout for the new release of the book that's entitled I Rise Living Beyond the Bruises. Again, if you would like to get in touch with Tamara, uh, make sure you check my show notes. All of her information will be there in the show notes. Tamara, thank you so much for being on the show today. Your story was such an intimate 
passionate story. Mm-hmm. And I'm so sure that my listeners gained so much knowledge from you today and nuggets that they could use to be able to change their life. So to my listeners out there, thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, please stay empowered and educated. You've been listening to Life Strategies with Monique. 